connectivity speed. If your server is in Latvia, you won't connect to it as fast as you would if your server was in the US. But even with that, there are other considerations because you know the US has terrible privacy laws <laughs> in general. Um, there's also key disclosure, and that is a very big, I deem it as a problem. Other, people's do, other people don't see it quite the same way. Key disclosure is when the government can compel you to give up your encryption keys. There are a few countries that do this. I think the US is one, Italy, I'm thinking Germany and Russia and a few others. Australia, yes, that's a big one that came up recently. And then there's also, well that also has to do with company location. Because even if your server is in Italy, come on, why is this? Even if your server is in Italy, your company may be in Australia. In which case, your server is still bound by Australia's laws. And you have to comply with whatever they may be, whether that's you can't use PGP on your server or any other secure kind of encryption. And there's also one of the reasons I'm about to move away from NetCup is because Germany has, you are required to have an Impressum. That's spelled Impress UM. And one of the things it requires is that your real name, your telephone number, your email address, and your street address also have to be listed in a very public place on the website. And I'm not willing to put that kind of personal information out there. So I am in the process of moving to Time for VPS. They're hosted in Canada. And Canada does, does not have key disclosure. They don't have the impress room. There's a lot of really cool things about them. And I do want to issue a warning. With today's internet, everyone is relying on someone, whether that's AWS, Google Cloud. If you're, if you're doing cloud computing, you've got AWS and Google Cloud. And with Google Cloud, there was the issue last week, maybe the week before, where all of their, well, not all, pretty much all of their services were down in the US because someone made a mistake and rolled the change out to a larger region of servers than they meant. And because of that, I think Instagram was having issues, Google Search was having issues, YouTube wasn't working at all in some regions of the US, and even Nest locks on your doors weren't working because the Google Cloud infrastructure that powered them was down. So people were locked out of their houses. But, like I said, that's if you're doing you know, cloud computing. There's also, you're relying on your registrar. With free top-level domains, like I said, they can sell your domain off to the highest bidder. They could revoke it at any time. But if you are paying for domain, you're more e it's easier to trust them. But you still want to verify you trust what they're doing and you, because you're relying on them. But the same goes for your VPS provider. You want to make sure you trust that they're not monitoring everything you're doing, sniffing your location, your network traffic, etc. So we've gone through getting a domain, getting a VPS, and considerations for both. Yeah? That's, that's perfectly all right. VPS stands for Virtual Private Server. In most cases, those are on in virtual machines on bare metal in a data center. And one of the things, thank you for, yes. And thank you for bringing that up because that reminded me of something else I want to bring up. When you have a bare metal server, it is more difficult to monitor because they have to actually be at the server to monitor what you're doing, to track the, I'm not wording this very well, um, with a virtual server, they can have monitoring tools on the bare metal of the server that can monitor your RAM, 
in real time while your server is running, but when you have a bare metal server, that's much more difficult. So back to where we are now, you have a server, you have a domain, now you need services. What are you going to host on the server? What components are you going to put in your cloud? And there's a great list right here on GitHub. And we will, let's see here. And you can see some of the awesome things here. These are all services you can host on your own server. They're all open source and free. If you want to do analytics, see what kind of traffic your website is getting, that kind of thing, there is a plethora of options. One of the ones a lot of people use is Matomo. And Michael Tunnell actually mentioned that yesterday during his talk on open source marketing. Because it is, it, like it says right there, it gives you more than just powerful analytics. And it used to be known, known as Piwik, if you've ever heard of that. But let's see, maybe you want to host your own email on your server. So you are completely dependent on you, not anyone else. There's a list here as well. One of the ones a lot of people use is I read mail and MailCow. MailCow, all you do is download a script to your server. It's meant to be run on a fresh install of Debian Stable. You download the script, you install it, you have a full mail server. You don't have to mess with Postfix, Dovecot, whatever database you want to use. It provisions everything for you. Maybe you want see here. Th there's everything. <laughs> One of the things I use quite a bit is a paste bin. So we go here, and there's a long list. While all these are good, the one I prefer is, let's see, a private bin. It says right there, the server has zero knowledge of hosted data. The way private bin works is it encrypts and decrypts your paste in the browser. All the server gets is the encrypted data. So for example, I host this, and someone pastes a huge database of passwords and usernames. In most of the time, I would be liable for that. With private bin, because the server has zero knowledge of what's hosted there, I'm not liable for that. It's great for the server administrator. There's also services like XMPP you can host. Has anyone ever heard of that? Jabber, XMPP. I use that every day to communicate with a lot of people. Yes. I, yeah. If you use a client that is compatible with Omemo, all you have to do is enable it. It's that simple. You can also set up a service like Mastodon. Has anyone ever heard of that? A lot of people. Great. I run my own Mastodon instance. But there's also, so Mastodon is powered by ActivityPub. There are other servers that are compatible with that, like Pleroma, MissKey, and quite a few others. And they can all talk to each other. And that's one of the things I love about the Fediverse. <laughs> Do what? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm fairly certain. I'm, I'm okay. Great. So now I've got a list of stuff we can install. Maybe you know what you want to host for yourself. On to the stressful demo that I've been <laughs> stressing about all day. So the one we're going to bring up is, let me move this over here. Three. 
I was told that this projector would be 1080p, and it's not. So mirroring my displays like I plan to might be a little difficult. Okay, this, you can see what's in the center of the screen, though, that's okay. So, this is Kodi MD. Great. You can really see that. Here. This is Kodi MD. I have it on the dark mode right now, but we can switch that. There, you can see that now. It's a wonderful markdown editor. You've got all of your notes here. You can, like I've been taking notes on the presentations I've attended. And here is what I took for Noah Chalaya's presentation yesterday. I didn't take much, many notes because I was trying to listen to what he was saying rather than make sure I write everything down. But, and here is notes from Jason's presentation yesterday. One of the great things I like about it is that it is live, real-time collaboration on Markdown documents. No, I, yeah, I typed those out right here. Yeah. No, I, I typed that out here, and then there's the link down there. Yeah. A lot of people actually use this, and I didn't realize it. The Simon Quigley from the Lubuntu, he were, he, he's everywhere. <laughs> but Simon Quigley was saying that he uses this every day and he's going to bring it up to the next Ubuntu Flavors meeting to see if they'll host an instance. Because it is wonderful for collaboration. Do what? Yes, you can have multiple people edit at one time. And they will show up here. Right now it is just me. Yes. And you can mouse over their cursor and it will tell you who's where. It is wonderful. Um, there's also the publish button, which gives you a static URL and a nice little view. If you are on a wider display than this tiny projector, <laughs> over here you have a table of contents that you can expand top level headers, see the lower level headers underneath. Right now that is displayed here. So we can jump to tools, we can jump to shell check, and learning materials down here at the bottom. And the slides for this presentation I actually wrote in Kodi MD right here. So you've got the layout of your document is defined in YAML metadata up here at the top. So here you say, I want this formatted as a slide. You give it the title, description, and then you've got a bunch of options for how you want your presentation to work. You've got all your markdown like normal. And these are speaker notes that I can see on my screen, and you can't. <laughs> so it, it's great for remembering things. That's just what mine looks like. But that's what we're going to be hosting today. And I will have to resize this. That's close enough. So I already have a VPS. Yep, right here. And I also have already have a domain. I'm just going to use a subdomain from nixnet.xyz. That's my website. 
we're just going to get right into it. I have some snippets here on my wiki for quick copy pasting things I've learned in the past that are good practice. One of the first things when you get a VPS is securing it. By default, when you SSH in, you're going to be the root user and you will log in with a password unless you provide your SSH key. In most cases, you just set up a password. So that's terrible. Passwords can be brute forced. <coughs> so one of the first things we're going to do is create a new user with the user add command. And that is user add M name of your user. And M creates the home directory in slash home slash name. And we're going to name it self. So then we can I forgot about that. Just a second. Okay. Now again, we are root, so we're going to super user into self. There we go. We are self. And then the next thing we're going to do is edit slash Etsy slash SSH slash SSD SSHD underscore config. Because by default, permit root login is set to yes. You probably can't see that. I'll just say it. Permit root login is set to yes. And that permits root login over SSH. And we are searching for that. That is terrible contrast. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, I am. <laughs> Do what? Set. That helps. Can you see that better? I apologize. So we are searching for permit root login. And right now it's set to yes. So we are going to change that to no. And then save it. And the other thing we're going to look for is password authentication. And we're going to set that to no. Because we want to only log in with our SSH key. Like I said, passwords can be brute forced. SSH keys are much harder to get into. So. Password authentication, we uncomment it and change it to no, and then save it. And then we need to generate SSH keys. Yes, that's what we want it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll repeat that for everyone else. If you want to make your SSH keys more secure, in SSH keygen, you can specify dash A and tell it how many rounds you want it. So it's magnitudes of orders of magnitude more secure. Um, I didn't know that. Thank you for telling me. Um, and if I say something incorrect and you know better or have a different opinion, please tell me. I'm here to learn just as much as you are. <laughs> but um, so now I have my SSH key in .ssh authorized keys. Because I can SSH in and I already have it set to the key, it's in the root. So I'm going to delete that. So I can't even SSH into the root account. You should only be able to SSH into a user. One of the things another person, another speaker brought up yesterday was that 
you shouldn't even be able to remote into an account with super user privileges. You should not be able to escalate your privileges. I don't know how to get around that, but he said you should be able, you should figure something else out, and that's why I'm, I'm planning to do that. So then we are, like it says there, let me close this. And I will have to, I'll just leave it like that. This is going to copy my local SSH key into, actually I shouldn't do that, into self at kernel. That was me figuring out what the IP address of this server is. I'm going to copy it. Then this command is going to copy your local SSH key into the remote server so you don't have to what did that say? Permission denied. Hmm. Well, I, I haven't restarted SSH yet, though. Um, anyway, we can just cat.ssh slash ierc.party into my clipboard. And then we can go back in here, su self. said permission denied. <laughs> uh, probably. Hmm. Well, <laughs> do what? Yeah, that's what I'm. <laughs> um, do what? Wait a minute, I know where I am. Okay, I am in home slash shell. Huh. Okay. I am making a fool of myself right now. <laughs> this is exactly what I was nervous about. <laughs> Yeah, it is, and that's the problem. <laughs> so the owner is self, the group is self, the user is self has... Right now I am. Well, here. Here I wasn't, though. Well, here, Sue. Um. Yeah, see? Okay, now we're in slash home self. Okay, that's correct. Hmm. And that should be correct as well. Huh. So the issue was that when I became the self user, I was still in slash root and I forgot to CD just run CD and go to my home directory so now that we're in there we can copy my SSH key over <laughs> I'm glad 
Okay, so now it's in there. <laughs> and now we should be able to make that a bit bigger. SSH self at, what was that? I've already forgotten what the IP address was. And now we're in as a normal user, not as root. And what I'm going to do is scp my dot bash rc into self at 3a dot. Do what? What do you mean? Forgot to add the colon there. <laughs> there we go. There we go. And now we can SSH back into self, and it looks somewhat better. It's not the best. I use ZSH on my laptop, but Bash is on the server. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is vim.ssh config. These are things I like to do. So now we just change this to self. What this does is when you specify cloud in uh, at the host line, that lets me run the front of that. What was it again? Oh, well. Can you see that? <laughs> yes. OK, well. When you specify cloud on that line, it lets you run SSH cloud. And that way, you don't have to type self at 138.197.79.31 every time you want to get into your machine. Yes. Okay. So now we can run SSH Cloud, and we are self as we should be. I swear I prepared. <laughs> um, well, that's everything in that section. I wrote this wiki last night because I was afraid I would forget snippets of commands under stress while I was up here, as just happened. And then, so these are some of the common packages that I find myself always installing. A Vim, of course, Nginx, Git, curl, DNS utils, MariaDB dash server, and certbot. Vim is, of course, the text editor. Let me. There, you can see that better. Vim is, of course, the text editor. Nginx is a web server similar to Apache, but I like it because I think it's a bit faster. Git, of course. Then curl, DNS utils, MariaDB server, and certbot. MariaDB dash server is a My MySQL server. And then certbot is how you generate SSL certificates for your websites. And one of the other things we'll be installing today is Node.js. And that is the command in the Node source repo on GitHub that they provide for installing on Debian stable. And this is a link to that repository. And I've already installed these because my server is a bit slow. <laughs> so then the next thing we're going to do is ensure that we have these things. Node.js 8.5 or up. Let me backtrack again. This is the CodeMD repository on GitHub. Or this is the CodeMD organization and their server repository on GitHub. And this is the 
doc setup manual setup dot md file for installing manually. They also provide a Docker image, and I'm thinking a community member made an Ansible playbook for installing it. But we're just going to use the manual setup. And some of the requirements are Node.js, a database. It has support for a lot of them. I prefer to work with MySQL. It's the same as MariaDB. You can also use SQLite, MS, SQL, and Postgres. We also need NPM, which is, I keep forgetting to make this bigger. NPM, which is Node Package Manager for Node.js. We need Yarn and Bash for the setup script. And for building the application, you should use two gigabytes of RAM because some things can crash. But it'll be all right if you have less. So then on to the instructions. Come on. What? Stop. There we go. Clone the repository or download a release and unzip it. So we're going to go back up here to the repository. Clone. We're going to go over here. Before we do that, I almost forgot something else. It is good to add a user, sorry. Because the way I run Kodi MD is with a systemd service, and you should never run applications as root. That's one big thing. And it's always good to, it's good to run web applications as their own user to prevent it from interfering with other applications you may be running. So we are going to We didn't set a password. Like I said, I'm making a fool of myself. Um, because we didn't specify a password when we were creating the user self, I now can't get into super user. So I don't have root access, which is not very good. So instead of that, we will use, yes. I didn't set a password for the, I logged out of root, yeah. So these are some of the pitfalls. <laughs> this is what you don't do. How about that? That's what I intended to do. Right. Okay. 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 Yes. <laughs> so I'll repeat what he said. It's always good practice when you are messing, when you're trying to lock out root, it's always good practice to have another terminal open with root privileges in case you mess something up like I just did. <laughs> so we will use, do what? We will use my server for installing. so we can see more command output. So I already have a Kodi MD user on my server because I run a Kodi MD instance. And as you can see here, when you sue into another account, you're still in the directory you were before. We didn't see that before. Do what? Okay, thank you. 
Right. Okay. And I'll repeat. Do what? Okay. Okay. So I'll repeat what he said. Pseudo su minus the user automatically puts you in that directory. See, we are in slash home slash code EMD. Um, and if we run ls, we will see code EMD is already downloaded. And there's all the source. I use a weird terminal, obviously. Um, no, this is an, a plugin for ZSH that has fish auto completions. <laughs> yes, that is a fish thing. And I liked it, so I found a plugin for it. Um, So we'll go back here into the manual installation. And because I already have it installed, we will, I guess we'll just review this and look at my configuration setup. Some of it. I don't want to put passwords out there. <laughs> so enter the directory type bin slash setup. It'll install npm dependencies and create config files. And we can see that bin is right here. So then we can ls bin nc setup. And we can even look at some of the code for bin. And it will tell you if yarn is installed or not and give you how to install it, where to install it, things like that. It's actually quite simple if you know Bash. I'm not that good with Bash, but I know Jason is good with Bash. Um, then, we can, then we set up the configs. It says see more below, but that was before we code MD changed repositories. It used to be hack MD, and code MD was the community edition, but hack MD wanted to be more commercial. So there was a split a couple of months ago. Code EMD forked the repository so it's all open source. HackMD is making proprietary extensions and running a hosted instance. So the organization is Code EMD and we now have the server. So we will look in here for configuration options. Two main ways, the config file or environment variables. Environment variables are for Docker. The config file is for the way we're installing it. So we can look in here and see all of the options. And there are a lot of options. For content security policy, um, Gravatar and CDNs, the last release changed it from Gravatar to Libravatar which is a Libre alternative to Gravatar, which is kind of nice. And then users and privileges for your instance, like this one is set to locked. Why? I don't know what that's happening. But locked is where the owner can edit and view, where the owner can edit and everyone else can view. And there are a bunch of other options. Like you can allow anonymous edits, allow anonymous people to use it, allow anonymous people to edit documents, and people can create a new note by existing, by accessing a non-existent URL. You can set the default permission. There's freely, editable, limited, locked, protected, or private. And those are all kind of self-explanatory. Private is where only you can view it or edit it. Freely is anyone can edit or view. And then there are different fine-grained permissions within there. And you can allow people to sign up with email. You can allow people to sign in with email and disallow people to register 
you can create an account for them so they'll only be able to log in. But you can disallow people from registering, which is kind of nice. These are coming later. It does not yet have LDAP login for single sign-on and similar services. You can set it to use AWS, Amazon S3 for upload storage. You could use Mineo, Ludim. But you can also set, up, set it up to store files locally, which is really nice. I like it. But I'm not going to display my config file because it has passwords. And I don't want to put those out there. So I guess the next thing we'll look at after the config, after we set up the config, it says to build the front end bundle with npm run build. Self-explanatory, it builds the front end bundle. And then you change .sqlize rc with your database connection string. So if you're using Postgres, you would have Postgres colon slash slash username of the of the my, of the SQL user and then password of the database, or password of the user, and then at the end of the string you have the database name. And over here I have MySQL commands that I always forget. I always find myself having to look up how to create a database how you create a user, how you grant permissions, all of that. So I've collected all those here. So we can, I will show databases and show the users from all of my databases. Uh, let's see. And you can see all of the databases for other services I host. Bookstack is the wiki in the, in the other window. Then we have CodyMD. Flarum is a modern forum. It looks, it looks very modern. That's one of the things I like about it. Um, Framadate is a poll creation tool by Framasoft. They're a French company. They, they create free and open source software. I'm not sure if this is pronounced Gitea or Giti or Gitia, but it's a self-hosted Git server. So you can move away from GitHub or you can stop using GitLab if for some reason you don't like it. But those are the databases I have. And then we can show users. And right now I have the usernames the same as the database names, that is not best practice. It is better if you have the usernames different from the database names. So once we use create database, code MD, create user, username at localhost, and define a password, we have to grant the permissions right here. And then once that's done, we're ready to start it. And the way they recommend you use, you start it manually once. So you can see if there are any errors while it's starting, node errors, system errors, config file issues, whatever. But after you test it, you can run it however you like. And I have a systemd service for running it. So it restarts after it crashes. It starts automatically as soon as my server boots up. And because we're using my VPS for this, we can actually look at it. Uh, so then we've got the description here. We specify when it should start. It should start after the network and after system D network D. And it's simple service. I can actually delete that line because I don't need it. But here we specify the runtime directory and the working directory. And the working directory is slash home slash codeemd for the user and then slash codeemd for the repository. 
and we tell it specify that it should run as the user code end, not as root as it would otherwise. And then this is the command it uses to start in this directory, npm start dash dash production. And it re always restarts, after, if it crashes, it always restarts after 15 seconds. You can say three seconds, you can say five seconds, you can say 10 days if you want. But after you set that up, you can do system CDL restart or enable dash dash now coding and coding MD. And system CTL enable says tells system D to start the service on boot and when you add the dash dash now flag that says start it now. Otherwise you would have to do system CTL enable code MD and then system CTL start code MD if you want to actually start it. So saying we've run that added the service, that's it. So then the server will be running, we'll have all our config files in place, the website will be live, and we can view it over here. It's my instance. And you've got some information about it over here. Let's make it a bit smaller. And like I said before, it has a ton of features. You can create charts. Any of you know what MathJax is? Any of you know what LaTeX is? Okay, MathJax is a lighter weight web version of LaTeX. So you can write LaTeX in your CodyMD notes. I used that last semester for calculus. I was able to take notes in calculus class real time with CodyMD rather than having to type everything. And I also, because it's on a website and public, I was able to share it with my classmates and they use my notes to study. <laughs> but then, once there's a new version, here's a guide for upgrading or installation. Look at the requirements, verify what version you're running, fully stop it. You can do that with systemctl. If you're using the systemd server, you can use systemctl stop code MD. And then you just cd into the directory, git pull, if you cloned from a Git repository. If you downloaded the release, you can unzip it in the directory. Things will be overwritten, or relevant files will be overwritten. Your configs and everything will stay the same. Then you run bin setup. It will install the new dependencies if there are any. Then you build the front end bundle, start at once, and then you can restart the CodyMD server with systemctl restart CodyMD. And then you'll be upgraded. Um, let's see, was there anything else I wanted to talk about? I don't think so. Thank you, Firefox. I didn't know that. Um, actually, let's go to here. Thank you for attending. <laughs> Even through all of the issues I had and things you should now not do and remember not to do, um, I saw a hand. Mm -hmm. You can, for for automated, if you want to automate the backups, there are things like you can set up a systemd script to run backups every so often, or you could do a cron job. That, that, those are really useful. Um, that's what I was about to say. You can download the backups to your PC, put it on an external drive in your house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you can put it on another server if you'd like. Off-site backups. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Yes. I do host Nextcloud at my house on a Raspberry Pi. And I don't really recommend that. If, you're, if it's just for your friends and family, it's OK. But it'll only be as fast as your router, your home connection is. And if your internet connection goes out, you can't access your server. So you, I recommend using a VPS, but hosting at home is perfectly all right. Yes, I am. Rustic. Okay, that's really nice. I'm gonna have to look this up, and I may start using it. So he was talking about Rustic, and you can go to Rustic.net to see it. It does backups over so SSH, encryption, deduplication, for Reducing the size because backups, right, right. Um, there's also Borg backup that I know a lot of people use. And I don't remember what the website for that is, but we can look it up. Here, another deduplicating archiver with encryption and compression. And it does a lot of the same things as Rustic. So it's up to your preference what you want to use. Are there any other questions? So he asked if, all, if my services were hosted on the same server. Mine are at the moment. If you are just one user hosting it for yourself or your family, it's OK. But it's better to have like one or maybe two services per VPS to spread them out. That way, if one VPS goes down, all of your services don't go down at one time. Um, excuse me? Yes. He asked if there are security downsides to having everything on one server. Yes. If your server gets compromised, someone gets privilege escalation and becomes root, everything is compromised. Whereas if you have them on separate servers, if one is compromised, that's the only one. Are there any other questions? He asked why I didn't use Docker for installing some of these services. I like to know how a service is set up behind the scenes. That way, if something breaks, I know how to fix it. Docker is really simple, really easy to use, and it's great if you just want something quick. But if you end up, if you plan to host something long term, I like to know how it's set up so I can fix something if something goes wrong. Are there any other questions? I just typed them all in class. <laughs> no, <laughs> I've since deleted them. <laughs> Do what? Mm -hmm. Here. I can show you a sample of that. It has some of the same syntax. It's not all exactly the same. So right here, you can render LaTeX mathematical expressions with MathJax, as on math.stackexchange.com. And here, we will, so you can see actually what the syntax looks like. So this is what it looks like. You've got the single dollar sign for inline expressions, the double dollar sign for larger equations. Yeah. Are there any other questions? 
I got it just for this, so I'll just destroy the droplet. Are there any other questions? OK. Right. Yes. It, what, what he said was some VPS providers let you change the root password in the web console, the admin interface. So that is one way to fix that without destroying the VPS and getting a new one. Um, it's 10 o'clock, so we are out of time. Thank you for coming. <laughs> okay. If you want to really conveniently want to zoom to the room, there's something called teleport. Okay. What's a teleport is a web based, um, basically the front end.
Okay. Yeah. Oh, year nine? Which one? Yeah, oh, nine. 2009, yeah. My first one is 2010. All right, if you need to, let me know. Okay. How's it sound? Can everybody hear me? In the back? At all? Can you hear me? Okay. I'll take that total lack of reaction as a yes. Yes. Hmm. Let me get it all on the screen now. Hold on. It's good we're doing this now. This is a good time to do this. We've got a couple minutes, so it's... That a little better? Readable? That a little better? So if anybody's interested beforehand, all of these slides are available on GitHub and all the images too, of which there are none. Slot doesn't start till 10.15, so let me give people a chance to show up. Is that them or me? Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah? I would have a problem with that because I need both hands to type while I do this live demo. So that would be, that would be a hindrance. I'm going to hope everything works the way it's supposed to. This would be. Yeah, dragon speaking with a control A, you know, right square bracket. Yeah, no, 
no, no, no, no, no. That's not going to happen. It's a four-hour presentation. Yeah. <laughs> yes, a brief six-hour introduction to screen. podium moves slightly as I go back and forth. I feel like I'm on a raft on a lake a little bit here. Everything moves a little bit. What's that? I, yes, pretty much must use the lapel, yeah. Because okay. I need hands. Am I coming in loud enough? Can you guys hear me back there? Back row, can you hear me? I'm seeing no reaction. Is that better? Okay. Do what? Oh, okay. Can move it up a little more. Extremely manual volume control. Another couple of minutes. Okay, it's 10.15, how about I get started here? Um, 
I'm Bob Murphy. We're going to do an, a brief introduction to GNU Screen. I'm going to warn you up front, I was raised by New Yorkers, so I tend to talk way too fast. So uh, bear with me. I'm going to try to keep it at a reasonable pace. And I just want to encourage people to ask questions during this. I'm all for some interaction because there's a lot of little fiddly bits. And please, if you have any questions, ask. I'm more than happy to answer them. If I feel that uh, it's getting uh, too long and we might not finish it, I'll let you know. Otherwise, just uh, feel free to ask me questions as we go along here. So I am a systems administrator from New Jersey. I have uh, been using Linux personally for about 20 years. I've been doing Linux system administration for about five. Um, I want to say something before I, before I get started, too. I want to thank the, uh, the guys that are putting on Southeast Linux Fest. They do a great job. I've been coming for about 10 years, uh, finally getting up here to do a talk. And uh, it's been a great environment, and I really appreciate everything they do to make this conference happen. Um, so let's see. This presentation, there, were, there will be no cat pictures. There will be no memes, because this entire demonstration will be done in text, because that's what screen is. Screen is a text utility. We're going to stay in the spirit of that. Everything will be text from here on out. Might also be a little too long for the screen, but that's OK. So. What is GNU Screen? That's as close to graphics as we're getting. Holy cow, that's invisible. Yeah, that's yellow. So GNU Screen, I'll say what is it. It's GNU Screen. It's a terminal multiplexer, which sounds terrible. Yes. I can't change the only thing. I can't. I don't know. Can someone back there dim the lights? If I make it bigger, the stuff is not going to fit on the screen. I'm already like right at the limit. I could try. Some of the stuff's going to run off the bottom, though. So don't worry about the GNU screen. Most of the stuff is not in that yellow. OK. <laughs> most of the stuff's not in that yellow font, so that's not going to be an issue for most of it. So, so, so terminal multiplexer. What a terminal multiplexer is, it's like a, this is going to kill the video, a terminal multiplexer is like a window manager <laughs> for your terminal session. So your terminal session, you're going to be able to set up more than one active window, and you're going to be able to divide up the screen if you like. So it's sort of like having a window manager for your terminal session. It makes it really useful. Let's go back one. Terminal multiplexer, despite the fact that it sounds horrible, it's surprisingly useful. And uh, terminal multiplexer might sound familiar for one of the questions that's coming up later. So it's part of the GNU project. So it's going to be included in any distribution you run or easily available in any distribution you run, um, be it uh, you know, any Linux, uh, BSD, any of that stuff. Very easy to get. So can we start, how's the green look on there? The green's readable? Thank God, because